Hello and welcome to this year's second Linguistic Society event. We are here with Professor Robin Carsten of UCL, we being myself and Selina. Uh, Robin is a specialist in pragmatics, semantics and the philosophy of language. She's taught at UCL since 1983, has been the editor of Mind and uh, Language, a journal, and um, since 2017 has been the president of the European Society for Philosophy and Psychology. Uh, in 2016, she was elected a fellow of the British Academy. So we are very lucky to have her here with us. Um, and we're going to be discussing all sorts of big questions ranging from philosophy and pragmatics and semantics. Um, Thank you very so, much for inviting me. Oh, pleasure to have you here. Uh, so you, um, your work is roughly in the, you say it's following Grice's philosophically based pragmatics. What roughly is the, um, the Gricean program and how does your work fit into it and depart from it? Yeah, I mean, that's a, of course, a very, very huge question. So um, my answer will be a bit incomplete, but Yes, I, I work primarily in pragmatics. That's that's what I think of myself as a pragmaticist. I think that's the word. Um, but Grice himself, you know, it's quite interesting. He never actually used the word pragmatics in his work. Um, and I think his program was something something much bigger than pragmatics in a sense, and and actually different in certain key respects. So. Um, I think he's, his interest was really in the nature of meaning in a very um, broad and fundamental kind of a way, in particular what he called non-natural meaning, of which linguistic meaning is a key case, um, and how that arises via human psychology, certain sort of psychological states that underlie the possibility of linguistic meaning. Um, but from the point of view of the way in which most of us in linguistic pragmatics uh, rest our work on Grice, I think it's, um, it's important to draw on two distinctions that he made. So he made a, a distinction between linguistic meaning on the one hand, or conventional meaning as he called it, we call it encoded meaning in relevance theory. So that on the one hand, and speaker meaning, on the other hand, the sort of meaning that a speaker can express, communicate, convey when she uses language in a particular context, in a particular way, drawing on particular assumptions that she and um, hopefully also the addressee can access. So that is, um, I think, sort of a fundamental distinction. And a second important distinction in Grice's work which sort of parallels this one, the one I've just mentioned, is between what a speaker says, so that is largely what her language tells us, what she says on the one hand, and uh, what she implicates on the other hand. And that is something, this is where he, in his paper, Logic and Conversation, or several papers actually, but that is sort of the key one, um, That that is where he, really had its his big impact, I think, on linguistic semantics and pragmatics. And that is because he developed this notion of conversational maxims, norms that some of you will be familiar with, um, as guiding communication and, and comprehension, therefore. So the idea is that, um, roughly speaking, is that speakers should be, these are sort of um, norms, these are sort of prescriptions, a speaker should be truthful, informative, relevant, and um, mannerly. <laughs> so, so not uh, uh, overly obscure, not too long, not too um, ambiguous, and so forth. And that hearers or addressees can assume that a speaker is uh, conforming with these maxims and use those assumptions in deriving further meaning over and above the meaning uh, that's in the language that is what is said. So the derivation of implicatures. And a very, very, very simple case would be um, if I walk into your room and I say to you, it's freezing in here. 
So I've said something, I've expressed a proposition with the language there, but most likely I've also implicated something else, namely, you know, you should put the heating on or um, I'm not staying because <laughs> it's too uncomfortable or something of that sort. And this um, approach to, to meaning, uh, especially to um, conversational meaning, uh, has been particularly, I think, important, not only, but particularly important in um, thinking about non-literal uses of language. So when we use a metaphor, um, my lawyer is a shark, but he's not literally one of those creatures, but he has certain properties which, using your pragmatic inferential mechanisms, you can derive. So there are certain implicatures, as Grice would put it, that you derive in understanding what the speaker has said there about their particular lawyer. So um, perhaps that's enough, is, is that enough perhaps on, on the Griceian picture? Then, you know, moving to my own work, which has been within relevance theory, the relevance theory framework, which was developed by Dan Sperber and um, Deidre Wilson back in the 1980s. Um, we think of ourselves as a kind of in the Gricean tradition, post Gricean pragmatics, we would call it. And we look to Grice as a kind of um, father figure, a founder of uh, modern inferential pragmatics. The most important part of that being that he put paid to any notion that you, that you can talk about, you can understand communication in terms of codes alone. You can't. It's a question, it's a matter of speakers presenting evidence, and some of that evidence might be from a code, like a language. Some of it might be from um, facial gestures, um, hand gestures, all sorts of other sort of um, non-verbal elements. All of that provides evidence to the addressee, who then has to use her pragmatic capacities to infer the intended meaning, the speaker meaning, if you like. Um, so I think that was that is probably the number one thing um, that he put paid, Grice put paid, to the idea that um, we can have a code model of communication. And we have taken that over big time into relevance theory. So we very much support the idea that communication has to be thought of as primarily inferential. There may be a coded element which provides crucial evidence, rich evidence perhaps, but there will also always be this um, additional component of inference uh, that a hearer has to perform. Now, um, just to talk about a little bit about differences between um, Grice and relevance theory. Now, relevance theory has been developed within a sort of cognitive scientific framework. Um, so it's very much more concerned with actual processes, online processes, um, and relevance itself has been defined in terms of um, the cognitive effects that an utterance has. So that would include the drawing of implications. They would be cognitive effects. But also um, something that really isn't there in Grice, and which perhaps philosophers in general don't concern themselves with so much, and that is processing effort, cognitive effort. So we have defined, or I should really say Sperber and Wilson because it came from them, have defined uh, a notion of relevance in terms of uh, cognitive effects on the one hand, that's the sort of positive side, and processing effort, which is kind of the negative side on the other hand. And so the idea is that a notion of relevance has been developed here, which concerns um, getting the right balance that is retrieving a sufficient array of cognitive effects, positive cognitive effects from any stimulus that's coming in and that we're processing on the one hand, and on the other hand, trying to keep our processing effort, our precious mental resources, um, the use of those down to a certain manageable level. So it's, it's, this, sort of, it's this sort of optimal balance idea um, that lies behind relevance theory. Um, and so I'm not going to, perhaps I shouldn't go into too many of the technical details of relevance theory, but it's just worth adding, I think, that having developed this notion of relevance, and it is a fairly technical notion, um, 
it subsumes the Gricean maxims of informativeness, truthfulness, relevance, which he didn't really develop anyway, he just sort of mentioned it, and, and manner. So in relevance theory, we don't have all these norms, these maxims, we have this one fundamental overriding cognitive principle at work. So that's one major difference. I don't, I'm already talking for too long. Um, in my own, my own very own personal work, there's another um, major departure. Well, it's, it's perhaps not a departure, but uh, it builds more on Grice and extends uh, his inferential view. Um, I've tried to argue in, principally in my, um, my book, Thoughts and Utterances at, at considerable length, um, that the inferential um, element of comprehension of utterance interpretation extends way beyond implicatures. It actually extends right into what Grice was calling the what is said, the proposition that's explicitly communicated. Um, so I've tried to argue with usually using lots and lots of different examples and of course people will try to find other ways of explaining these examples but just to give you a flavor of it, um, if somebody says to you it's raining it's usually going to be relevant to know where that raining is taking place, the location of that raining. That's, where, that's what's going to have the implications for whether you can go out and play tennis or go for a walk or what, whatever. Um, that's not encoded in the utterance. It's raining. It's not linguistically encoded. So that location element is something that needs to be inferred. And I would say that that's part of the proposition explicitly expressed by the speaker. It's not like it's some separate proposition. The truth conditions, and I think you may want to ask me about the notion of truth conditions later, but what will make that utterance true or false is whether or not it is raining in the location that the speaker has in mind, because it's going to be raining somewhere in the world. That's no good. So that utterance, just it's raining, will always be true. But that's not the proposition that was intended. Something much more specific was intended. And there are lots and lots of examples of this. You know, that was a complete sentence, right? It's, it's not as if it was incomplete. And there are many other complete sentences like, um, John is ready. That's a perfectly complete sentence of the language that would be generated by a grammar. But you need to know he's ready for what? We're all, we're all ready for something at some time, um, but a speaker is almost never going to be communicating that a person is just in a state of readiness, you know, it's going to be ready for some specific activity or um, action. So that would be another contribution that pragmatic inference would make to the proposition explicitly expressed. And we, in relevance theory, we call that the explicature, kind of in parallel with implicature. So um, we don't use Grice's saying versus implicature. We talk of explicature versus implicature. And so these are two different kinds of propositions expressed um, by an utterance or part of the speaker meaning. The explicature usually has a component of decoded linguistic meaning, but it also has components of pragmatically inferred meaning. And that's something that I've done a lot of work on over, over the years. So it's a bit of a development of Grice, I would say. So the um, traditional semantics pragmatics distinction usually corresponds pretty roughly to what is said and what is sort of implicated. Does this break from that traditional carving or is that sort Yeah, of yes. Um, the I think the traditional semantics pragmatics distinction, you, you, you're right, um, it does typically line up with Grice's what is said and what is implicated. It's often expressed as, as semantics is concerned with the truth conditional content and pragmatics is anything else that happens to get uh, communicated by the utterance. So pragmatics is uh, meaning minus truth conditions, they often say. And so, um, yeah, Grice pretty much, I think, was going along with that, with his what is said, what is implicated distinction. Um, I mean, another way, though, of thinking about the semantics-pragmatics distinction, which is a bit more, I think, 
in keeping with cognitive science and the way psychologists think about language, think about utterances and, and comprehension, is to say, well, semantics should be thought of as the meaning that's encoded in the linguistic system, in the language. And then pragmatics is whatever else gets communicated in context. And so then the interesting question is, well, if that's a reasonable definition of semantics pragmatics, do those two definitions line up? So if semantics is truth conditional content, is that the same thing as what is encoded in a sentence? So this is where, again, the th what I was just talking about um, comes in. I would say no, <laughs> that they don't line up because pragmatics, as I just was saying, does contribute to the truth conditional content, as in the case of it's raining or he is ready. There's this missing, as it were, missing bit of um, a component of the truth conditional content that the pragmatics has to supply. Now, interestingly, you can kind of undermine that traditional distinction from the other side as well, because you think about certain words in the language, like um, we call them discourse connectives. So things like however, uh, nevertheless, moreover, on the one hand, on the other hand, even things like sentence adverbials, fortunately, fortunately, um, it isn't raining. So what's the truth conditional content there? Probably it's just, it isn't raining, but there's a sort of attitudinal element added by my saying, fortunately. So it looks as if these things, you know, however, what does that add to the truth conditions? However, John came late. Moreover, John came late. Although John came late. So although and but are, are other cases which don't seem to be adding truth conditional content, but they are important linguistic elements which have a meaning, have an encoded meaning. So once again, we've got encoded linguistic meaning, um, which isn't lining up with truth conditions. It's a sort of non-truth conditional semantics, you could call it. And there have been books with that very title. Um, back in the days when, tr when the idea was that, well, semantics just is truth conditions, people began to point out, well, there are all these other elements in the linguistic system which don't seem to be contributing to truth conditions. They encode a meaning, they're doing something. What are they doing? Are they sort of telling a, a, a hearer, an addressee, how to process the utterance? Yeah, maybe something like that. Or they're telling something about the speaker's attitude in the case of fortunately. So uh, I think that distinction between um, that old semantics pragmatics distinction, semantics truth conditions, pragmatics um, everything else, has broken down a little bit or certainly does break down if you want to think about semantics as what the language system gives you and pragmatics what uh, you infer in context. So pragmatic theories come under some um, criticism for its ambition that um, Chomsky, for example, has pointed out it, it might be trying to find a theory of everything. That seems quite different to this very specific um, sort of technical notions of relevance and so on. Um, so it, is it trying to come up with a theory of everything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not, <laughs> because it's not going to work if it is. Is it? I mean, he's 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 quite right that in, in the sense that it's it would be a foolish thing to attempt to um, give a systematic theory that just tries to encompass anything and everything. I, I mean, other people have criticised pragmatic and said you might as well not bother doing it, you know, for, for, for the same sort of reason. Um, Jerry Fodor being uh, another person who's, who's taken that sort of position. Um, well, I think part of the, I mean, perhaps the problem in all of this is context and, and what a context actually is. And I, I've already used the word context uh, several several times over, um, and it is crucial. I mean, we think of 
pragmatics as very much concerned with the context sensitive aspects of using language and implicatures depend on using a certain set of assumptions in our mind and deriving, inferring um, implications on the basis of those contextual assumptions. And um, Fodor, for one, Jerry Fodor, for one, has, as you might know, um, has said, well, really the only systems of the mind that you can study in a, in a systematic scientific kind of a way are what he calls modular systems, sort of self-contained systems, which um, are encapsulated, as, as he put it, which, which have, that is, which have only um, access to a very sort of limited range of information. And the problem that he, in particular, I'm not so sure about uh, whether this was Chomsky's worry, but um, certainly I'm familiar with Fodor on this. He said, well, with pragmatics, you know, um, you never know how much more information you should access and bring to bear on somebody's utterance. You know, it could, it's, it's pretty much endless. Anything, anything can be relevant to, to, the, to the utterance and to the situation that you're in. And so there isn't any sort of built-in um, endpoint, anything to contain the process. And, you know, he, he saw relevance as, as, a, as a massive issue. Um, well, <laughs> the, the relevance theory response to that is to say, well, actually, in principle, Chomsky and Fodi, you may well be right, but in practice, we human beings are managing <laughs> to understand each, each other's utterances pretty fast a lot of the time. It's almost as if it's a, um, an automatically triggered system that just goes into action and comes up with an interpretation pretty fast. Not always, of course, sometimes we have to think for days about what did she really mean when she said such and such to me? Uh, but we mostly don't do that. In our ordinary, quite banal uh, conversational exchanges, the information flows fast and pretty effectively for the most time, for the most part. Um, so what's going on? Well, I do think that a good thing, a, a lovely thing really about relevance theory is that it, it does give at least the beginnings of an answer to that by virtue of the fact of emphasizing something very fundamental about human cognition, which is this matter of us trying to conserve the amount of effort we expend, the amount of mental resources um, we use when we're processing stimuli in general, but um, utterances in particular. And now an utterance is a really particular kind of stimulus. It's what we call an ostensive stimulus. So it's not like, you know, just looking out the window and, and vaguely hoping to see something interesting, something relevant. When we address each other, with this verbal stimulus, as, as I'm doing right now, um, I'm kind of demanding your attention or requesting that you make a bit of effort, you know, <laughs> that you expend a bit of processing effort. And therefore, why should you do that? Well, the, the sort of the deal, the contract, the speaker here, a contract, I mean, it's not, it's not um, an explicit contract, but sort of underlyingly is, well, you're going to get something out of it. If you expend a bit of energy, a bit of effort in comprehending me, you should get some positive cognitive effects. You should get some implications. You should get some useful information from it. And that's kind of the understanding, I think, between speakers and hearers. We're all both speakers and hearers. We're often alternating those roles very, very rapidly. Um, and so as a speaker, um, I'm taking account of what I think is information accessible to you and the kind of contextual assumptions you're going to be able to bring to bear very quickly on what I'm saying. Um, and then you as hearers are thinking about, well, where's she coming from? You know, what contextual assumptions is she using? So there's this kind of really um, finely honed, I think, measure of mind reading in, in a very special sense of mind reading that we're concerned with getting our messages across. We're concerned with understanding each other and therefore this issue of making the, the pertinent information accessible to each other is something that we are actually monitoring most of the time. And so I just think there's an answer to this um, context problem, 
which is that, well, we don't consider everything that could be relevant. No, we just access those bits of the context. And by context, I mean here assumptions in our minds, which are pretty highly accessible to us, the most accessible ones. And this is built into relevance theory, which says, just follow a path of least effort. Just use, just mobilize the most accessible assumptions and see what cognitive implications you get. And if you get a satisfactory range of cognitive implications within the general ballpark of what you were expecting, stop. You're done. You've got the interpretation. So, you know, I do think that, that Sperber and Wilson developed a theory which at least goes some way towards meeting this objection that, oh, well, it's a theory of everything. Uh, and I'll ask one final question before I pass it on to Selena. Um, how do you see philosophy and language, uh, sorry, philosophy of language and linguistics sort of fitting together? Because we've discussed bits of both already. Yeah. Um, indeed, the philosophy of cognitive science as well. So um, how do these, how, how do those two things sort of interact? Um, yeah, I find it quite hard to make this distinction nowadays, I suppose because of my, in my own work, I, I have interact, well, first of all, we start with Grice, of course, who is a philosopher. And, you know, he really is fundamental to not only the work going on in relevance theory, but the work going on in other, we call them neo-Gricean theories, which are a bit different from relevance theory, you know, which might not use a, a, a sort of um, with quite the same notion of relevance, which might use a notion of coherence. Um, or, and some, our uh, linguistic pragma pragmatists actually just stick with the Gricean maxims. So it's, it's quite hard to make a sharp distinction for me anyway, between philosophy of language and linguistic pragmatics. Um, I mean, one thing to say about philosophers of language is that they're not mostly going to concern themselves with other areas of linguistics, you know, like syntax or phonology these very technical areas exploring the linguistic code um, because that doesn't fall into their traditional areas of concern, which are to do with meaning, primarily to do with meaning, the nature of meaning, the nature of um, language, um, of mental representation, of intentional states, these kinds of things that have concerned for philosophers for a very long time. So, so syntax and phonology and some of those very technical areas of linguistics um, probably um, don't have much meeting point with the philosophy of language. But um, in the areas of um, semantics and pragmatics, uh, I think we work very, very closely. And I think this is particularly so nowadays. So in my own work in relevance theory, um, probably the people I've interacted with most have been Francois Racanity, philosopher of language in Paris, Kent Bark um, in, in the USA. Now, both of these people have, have also worked in the, in, on this issue of um, the role of pragmatic inference in giving us the truth conditional content of utterances and giving what we call explicature. They might not use the same terminology, but essentially they are talking about the same kind of thing. Um, uh, Rob Stainton, another American philosopher of language, he's done a lot of work on subsentential utterances. So, you know, I walk into a room, I see you looking for something and I say, on the top shelf. It's not a full sentence, on the top shelf. Or I hold up a bottle of wine I've just bought and I say, from New Zealand, another prepositional phrase. Now he's done interesting work on that, maintaining, as I also would, that um, that's, there isn't like some hidden linguistic structure there, um, a subject, for example, for um, this bottle of wine is from New Zealand or something like that. No, you do it by pragmatic inference. It's a matter of um, figuring out what the speaker intends and simply recovering the relevant constituent and getting your explicature or your explicit content uh, in, the, in that fashion. And, he, and he's argued that. So I, I do find it quite... Um, 
difficult to point to very striking differences between what they are doing and what we are doing, although um, they might not be using, they aren't using usually um, the relevant theoretic notions that we are using. Um, I, I think nowadays, you know, and, and you, you mentioned at the beginning that um, that I've, I've been involved with the ESPP, the European Society for Philosophy and Psychology, hasn't even got linguistics in the title you know um but that's uh, an annual conference in which philosophers psychologists and linguists and now also neuroscientists and, and and various others come together to work together on a range of issues and these include these sorts of um semantic pragmatic pragmatic issues that we've we've just been discussing so i just think now and i think this is one of the great things about uh, our work in this field at the moment is that it is so absolutely resolutely interdisciplinary and it's not just now philosophy and the philosophy of language and and linguistic semantics it's also the um, psychologists making this incredibly important contribution with experimental testing of our theories and so that's something I could have mentioned earlier too when you talked about you know this um, this criticism that pragmatics is this great big whiffly waffly area <laughs> um, you know it is now really is being subjected to quite um, rigorous testing psychological testing so I think you know if, if that can prove that it's scientific um, then you know the the objections to it being far too too broad to bother with uh, really should should be put to bed in fact so um, yeah, philosophers, of course, they have slightly different concerns and issues. They're more likely to ask questions like, um, what is meaning? Or what is a communicative intention? Or what is a valid pragmatic inference? Some those those sorts of issues. They're, they're interested in um, conceptual analysis of this sort. And that's important, I think, for the rest of us who, who don't pursue those questions. We want to know that when we talk about a pragmatic inference that we're talking about something which you know has, has a certain sort of um, solidity and coherence to it and that our notion of communicative intention makes sense and so on so so there are these differences in emphasis but I think that by and large um, we're, we're now working together philosophers psychologists and linguists in this particular area of communicated meaning and um, the interpretation of utterances. Right, thank you. Um, if Selena, you want to carry on? Fabulous, thank you so much. I have to say it's really, really interesting, um, everything you've been saying. I suppose um, some of the questions that we had for this second half of the interview you've already touched on. So a couple of the questions I might want to sort of pick your brain out about a little bit more. Um, I think first and foremost, talking about this relation of pragmatics to cognitive science and if you could elaborate a little bit more maybe even on your work that you've been doing with psychologists or your involvement with um, psychologists and with philosophers anything more to add there so the relation of pragmatics and cognitive science really okay um yeah i i mean i never entirely know what cognitive science is i mean it, it seems it seems like a very very broad area and it's uh, it presumably covers uh, not just these issues to do with language and communication that, that we're talking about here today, but, but a much broader span to do with all sorts of different cognitive capacities, the human mathematical capacity, our spatial capacity, perception, all of those kinds of things. So pragmatics is going to, if it falls within cognitive science, which I, which I think it does, at least relevance theoretic pragmatics, I think does, um, then it's, you know, it's one smallish <laughs> sub-discipline within cognitive science. But it certainly is the case, um, as you were um, touching on, that um, the interaction with psychologists has become, I think, something of considerable importance and it's developed a lot in the past I don't know I lose track of time 15 years maybe something like that um, and it has been primarily um, a response to um, a worry there was a worry I think that our theories were not testable or if they were testable that they were not being tested and so um, 
within pragmatics, there really was a big drive, uh, led largely by Dan Sperber himself, um, one of the founders of relevance theory, um, Ira Novak, who is a psychologist um, in Lyon, and Richard Brahini, my, my, my colleague here at UCL. Um, I mean, there've been many others as well, but those are the names that come to my mind. And they were very adamant that we really had to get down to um, experimental testing, empirical testing of our theories and pitching one theory against another. And it was quite interesting back then um, because there really were two quite different views about certain pragmatic elements. So um, you probably have heard of scalar implicatures. So just to give the obvious one, um, which hinges on the use of some, some of the children left early we generally would feel that that carried an implicature that not all of them did. It doesn't have to, there are certain contexts in which it wouldn't and you can cancel it. Some of the children left early, oh in fact they all did. You know that's not a contradiction, that's fine. Um, but generally speaking if someone, it's, it, the thinking is if someone chooses to use some rather than all here or most, then they are implicating that not all of the children left early. Now there have been different, uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, this is, this is like a cottage industry on scalar implicatures and how they work and um, which person's theory is right and so on and so forth. But there were two really quite different views um, 15 odd years ago about how they worked and one was that we just derive that implicature not all, so from some to not all, automatically, it's a kind of default inference, um, that it's not really context sensitive. Um, in fact, what a context might do, subsequent to our deriving such an inference, is cancel it. You know, if we then realize, oh, that wasn't what was intended, then we'll cancel it. But, but we do always derive it. That was the idea, sort of default approach. And I think this is associated with um, Stephen Levinson, largely. Um, who wrote I mean, a really, really interesting book on pragmatics called, um, oh, what was it called? 2000, Presumptions of Meaning, I think, something like that. Um, and then there was a different approach developed at least partly within relevance theory um, by Dan Sperber and by um, Richard, Richard Brahini, uh, which said, no, this is a context sensitive inference. It isn't just derived in this default automatic kind of a way. Um, it does take a little bit of effort to derive that inference. All inferences take a little bit of effort. So we had here two quite different theories about how this little area of pragmatics worked. And this was put to the test. There were ways of uh, testing this by timing people's responses in different kinds of ways. Um, and I think also maybe eye, eye tracking, which I'm not, I'm not an experimentalist myself, so I'm, I'm slightly dithering around here, but I, I know that there are various tasks that different experimentalists um, used to test these different theories. And it did seem that by and large, the, um, the view that we don't derive these inferences in a default fashion was supported by the experimental evidence. But so this really very much depended on um, becoming familiar with the work of a, of a number of psychologists and how to design an experiment in an appropriate fashion and what sort of tasks would work well um, to do this kind of online testing. Because of course all of this is happening very, very fast. It's a matter of milliseconds. And so the, so the differences that are being measured are really um, a matter of like 300 milliseconds or, or whatever. Um, so there was a lot to learn there, a lot to learn from psychologists, from cognitive scientists. And I think probably this experimental turn, as we could call it, within pragmatics um, has meant that we are now really fully integrated into the cognitive science um, family um, and working quite closely with psychologists as a result. Thank you for that. That's certainly really interesting. And um, for everybody listening, we mentioned obviously before we started recording that not everybody who's going to be listening to this is coming from linguistics. So I'm sure if there's anybody listening on the psychology side of things, I'm sure they'll love to hear about how we're all connected and, as you say, part of the big cognitive science family together. So that's great. <laughs> 
Um, one of the other questions that you again have touched on earlier when you were talking, but I, I would really like to hear some a um, little bit more about what you think about this is the question that um, was sort of the proposal really that language doesn't have semantics as traditionally constructed and is it actually a pragmatic and syntax interface that we're looking at as opposed to semantics with truth conditions um, so at what point can we say okay maybe leave the semantics aside and we're looking purely at pragmatics and how you might sort of start to answer that very broad and big question yeah I, I, I wrestle with this a little bit myself um, I noted once in something that Chomsky wrote, he's written so much fun, so I probably wouldn't be able to find it now, but I do remember being rather thrilled by uh, something he said along the lines of, oh, well, perhaps it's just all syntax and pragmatics, forget about this referential semantics. And I thought, oh, yes. Um, um, I take it, well, I know I won't try to interpret Chomsky here. What I would say is that this, there is definitely something right about that, but I don't think it's the whole story by any means. So if we think that what we're primarily concerned with here, as we are in pragmatics, I think, is um, utterance processing and how that works, utterance comprehension, utterance interpretation, understanding each other, coordinating as speakers and hearers, then we are really in the ball game of manipulating mental representations one way or another and so if you take the view and i do um not everybody does although i think uh, it, there's a big division here really probably but anyway within relevance theory we have taken on we've taken on the view from foda and others that the language system so that is the the grammar the parser is modular is a self-contained system to a large extent so it's a, we can call it a decoding system, if you like. It decodes um, the language that the speaker presents us with. Um, now, what exactly that involves is a massive question, of course, but it clearly does involve grasping the syntax of the sentence or the phrase that the person produced and grasping the lexical meaning. Another big issue. So in relevance theory, we work with the idea that, well, the output of that system, that module, if you like, is something you, that you could call a logical form. And in a way, that's just a level of syntax. It, it's just a representation. It's a structured string of concepts. And that then you can think of as the input to the pragmatic system. And then what is the pragmatic system doing? Well, it's performing inferences and these inferences are being performed on mental representations, both the logical form that the language system gives us and representations in our mind of world knowledge, contextual knowledge. And these are interacting in some fashion, all these mental representations are interacting to give us the interpretation. So, there's a certain sense in which, well, where does, where does semantics in any traditional sense fit into that? Um, and if we, so if we're thinking of semantics in the tradi traditional sense of a, of a referential semantics, uh, uh, um, a relationship with the world, you know, words pick out things in the world, well, we haven't really got that in the picture that I've just talked to you about. Um, and a philosoph philosophical objection here, um, David Lewis, I think, if I remember correctly, is somebody who voiced this a long time ago is, well, all you're really doing, you folks in, um, in doing this kind of linguistics, this kind of pragmatics, is you're just translating from one representation into another representation into another representation, and you never get into contact with the world and surely surely we're talking we're telling each other things about the way the world is out there we've got to make this connection with the world somewhere that would be the, the argument and so i think um even though one might like this syntax is just syntax and pragmatics it's just internal representations i tend to be 
convinced that ultimately we have to make that real world contact. So I think there is a place for referential semantics, denotational semantics, or whatever you want to, to call it. Um, I think probably the place for it is in terms of giving us semantics of thought of mental representations rather than linguistic representations. Of course, you can give a, an external semantics for linguistic representations, but I would say that well, really, really what you're doing is you are ultimately giving a semantics for the thoughts or the propositions that we're expressing. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and I think, yeah, certainly if we're sort of focusing on these subjects very much from the semantics point of view or the pragmatics point of view, it can be really tempting to sort of say, well, can we leave one of them by? Can we leave one of them out? So it's really interesting to hear you as a pragmatist talking about the importance of the semantic interface there as well. Um, so with about 10 minutes to go, um, I suppose really it'd be great to hear more specifically about any of the research that you're working on currently or any past research that you've worked on that you think we might want to hear about. You obviously spoke in the beginning about the differences and similarities with the Gricean process and approaches, but yeah, anything really that you're working on that you would like to share? Goodness, okay, <laughs> wide open. Um, well, I'll tell you something that uh, in one area that I have been very interested, in, I'm not actually directly working on it at the moment, but every so often I, read another paper on this and I think oh yes I do want to think about this again and that is metaphor metaphorical uses of language I mean non-literal language use in general but like so many people I'm certainly not alone here I am particularly intrigued by our capacity for metaphor for saying these blatantly often blatantly false things my lawyer is a shark <laughs> Her job is a jail. He is a robot. You know, this, this kind of stuff. Um, it's just not a problem, is it? By and large, we, ju we just often very quickly get to what the speaker intended. But then there are these much less conversational cases, more extended cases, more literary cases, um, for which um, certain authors are very, very well renowned. So Shakespeare, for example, um, something like, now can I remember it? Uh, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets its hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Life, <laughs> well, well, life isn't that kind of thing actually, but it's marvelously evocative and we get a huge amount of meaning off it and we get it relatively easily. And so this really is, I, I think, a, a stunning fact about the human mind that from these blatant falsehoods, we get such profound meaning and truths. We get profound truths, actually, I think, out of a, out of a good metaphor, an extended metaphor of that sort. Now, this is, I could have mentioned this earlier because this is an area in which philosophers of language have had a huge amount to say over a very long period of time with some very profound analyses of metaphor. Um, and then along came Grice and he included this, uh, this use of language under his flouting of his maxims. So it was a flouting, an overt violation of, um, uh, of truthfulness, <laughs> clearly. Um, and not, not just truthfulness, because you can have a negative metaphor, can't you? I mean, she's, she's not a saint. She's not a saint. She's not an angel. She's not a gazelle. Well, that's true. She isn't any of those things. Um, but we already know that. So it's really, it's a different kind of violation. It's a violation of informativeness or relevance or something like that. So that's the way Grice did it. And in a way, that's a bit banal. You know, that doesn't really get to the depth of metaphor. So that's something that I, I have been working on within relevance theory and have been trying to develop some ideas on. Um, I think that with the, 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 the simpler, the lexical cases, my lawyer is a shark, we've got a good analysis within relevance theory. It's what we would, it, it falls within our account of lexical modulation, according to which 
uh, we're, we're actually, as hearers, as ad addressees, we're modulating encoded lexical meanings a lot of the time, not just for metaphor, we're doing it for all sorts of things. So um, the example I gave earlier when I, uh, when I said, well, I come into the room and I say, it's freezing in here. Well, it probably isn't literally freezing. You know, it's cold, right? So that's hyperbole. But you don't have any problem understanding what I'm getting at because you, you slightly modulate the word freezing there, you know, so it is, it's a slightly broader concept. It takes in states of quite extreme coldness without being literally freezing. Um, and so relevance theory actually with the, the lexical places, my lawyer is a shark or John is a robot, these kinds of things, says, well, we can give a very, very similar kind of account, a lexical modulation account, whereby we just, what's going on is a kind of broadening of the concept. So my lawyer is a shark. Well, we broaden shark, the concept encoded by the word shark. We broaden that so that it encompasses all creatures that are, let's say, predatory or vicious or <laughs> exploitative or manipulative or, or hurtful in certain sorts of shark-like ways. And so that will include not only sharks themselves, the, the, um, uh, the fish shark, but also human beings and perhaps certain other animals actually that behave in particularly vicious kind of a way. So we've got a, a, a broader concept. And we've got a whole story, which I, I won't go into here, it is quite a technical story, about how this modulation of encoded meaning takes place. It's obviously a pragmatic process, uh, and it also uh, is, as, as a sort of end result, it, it affects the explicature. It's a, it's a different concept that goes into the proposition explicitly communicated by the, by the speaker. So that's something that I've been interested in. But... I wasn't so convinced that that approach worked for the more creative, the more extended cases of metaphor, like the Shakespearean one, or um, another nice example that I remember discussing was um, from a modern novel. It was, it was about the nature of depression and the way she described it, the way this novelist um, described it was, I'm just trying to remember, um, Depression is a dull, inert thing. It is a toad that sits wetly on your head and takes a long time to gather the energy to slither off your head. Or something like that. You know, so this was a sort of really developed metaphor of a toad, you know, like a frog, sitting in this horrible, wet, heavy way on your head. Head. And this was a way of giving some content to the notion of depression. Um, it didn't seem to me that that was going to succumb to this lexical modulation process so well. So I've tried to develop a, a different account for more creative, more novel, more extended, more developed metaphors of that sort um, in terms of developing a whole just letting the literal meaning go. The literal meaning doesn't make sense. You know, depression is not a toad. Life is not a poor player on a stage. Never mind. We just go with the literal meaning and we develop a scenario and we develop, I think, I try to argue anyway, mental imagery as a result. Not just amodal conceptual representations, but mental images. And that these play together with the propositional content, a big role in giving us this whole developed scenario from which we do eventually derive a set of implications about the nature of life or the nature of depression, in the case of depression is a toad. So that's a, a slightly different story and I'm not sure that other relevance theorists agree with me, but that is, something that I myself have, have been trying to develop. 
That's really, really interesting and great to have that comparison between the more extended metaphor and the slightly more simple metaphor. And of course, we're all out here giving sharks a bad rap, which we can certainly <laughs> do. Um, that's really, really interesting. I think with a couple of minutes to go, um, unless there's anything else that you would like to add or anything specific that you'd like to share with people who will be listening, um, we might draw the interview to a close. Yes, I think probably that's sensible rather than me launching into yet a, yet another area. Just I guess there's just one other thing that did, I was thinking about before we began the interview that I might mention as another sort of positive about current pragmatic theorising. And that is that I think we are starting to interact in really interesting ways with psychologists again who are working with certain clinical populations. So people who have particular linguistic or communicative disorders. Um, there are some children who have something that's now called, I think, developmental language disorder, something like that. That's one thing. But the one that I'm more familiar with, of course, is, um, and you, you will know about this yourself, is the communicative um, abilities or the communicative profile, I should say, probably, of people with autism and the particular difficulties they seem to have with metaphor. Mm -hmm. non-literal non language quite generally um, and in particular we haven't talked about this but in, in particular with something like irony so you know ironical uses of language which you know appear, appear to be contradictory on the surface that that creates a major problem and you know there isn't time as you say for me to, to go into that but I think that the um, that some of the ideas within relevance theory are interacting in really interesting ways in providing people working um, with these clinical populations with some sort of hypotheses, with some sort of ideas about what, what the source of the difficulties might actually be. So that is one way in which, you know, it's, it's so important these days to try to have some sort of wider impact. Well, maybe this is where our current work in pragmatics could be thought to potentially at least have some interesting wider impact. Well, that's certainly wonderful. Thank you so much. And like I say, again, not everybody who's going to be listening is coming from the sort of hardcore theoretic linguistic background. So I'm sure that'd be really interesting to lots of people listening, if not everyone. Um, so really, I suppose it's just to say a massive thank you for spending an hour talking to us about everything you've discussed. It's been certainly very, very informative. And I certainly have enjoyed this a lot more than reading things. It's really <laughs> You can contact and listen to people. Yeah, it is nice to actually discuss, isn't it? Face to face. I mean, we are face to face, even if we're not in person. No, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you both. Yes, thank lot. you very much. And uh, I suppose we'll stop the recording now. But yeah, so bye for me and then Mal. <laughs> yeah, bye for me. And thanks so much. It's been utterly fascinating. Thank you very much, Mel. And thanks, Selena. Thank you.